Hello, everybody. This is Seth Williams from retipster.com, the RE Tipster podcast. I'm here with my co host, Jaron Barnes, and we've got a good friend of ours on the line today. This is Lucas Hall. And Lucas, for those of you who don't know him, he's the founder of landlordology.com, which is one of the more robust resource centers for landlords on the internet. It's an incredible website, it's amazing what he created. And, uh, you know, I, I won't tell too much of the story, but uh, Landlordology is now part of Cozy.co, uh, which is an amazing and free um, CRM software for mom and pop landlords, which can do all kinds of stuff. I've used it a little bit for a few things. I haven't ever used it like as my, you know, all in property management software, but I've never heard anybody say anything bad about it ever, which is amazing. I mean, most software services are a very complex thing to run and get right. So the fact that they're doing such a good job is pretty remarkable. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But Lucas is also, you know, in addition to being a loving husband and father, he's also a experienced and successful real estate investor. So we're going to talk a little bit about his background, what kind of properties he invests in, how he manages all of that. So Lucas, Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hey, Seth. Hey, Jaron. It's great to see you guys again. Thank you for having me, and I'm doing really well. Thanks. Awesome. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like it's like a family reunion. We uh, we were on a, in a mastermind group together for a, a really long time. I think it was close to three years, wasn't it, guys? Yeah, almost. Yeah, it was a yeah. while. For sure. It was a long time. So, hey, man, to kick this thing off, Lucas, tell us your superhero origin story. Like, you know, tell us your background. How did you get started in real estate? And then how did you get, get involved in Cozy? <laughs> superhero origin story. <laughs> I've never heard it phrased like that. Uh, so, yes. So I I started out just like everyone else. So I didn't have any properties, didn't uh, didn't know anything about real estate investing and was forced into it uh, through one means or another. And uh, for me, uh, I actually bought my first rental property uh, because of a girl. So <laughs> I tried. To, <laughs> I was trying to impress a girl, and uh, she, you know, I, I used to see her once a week, and I asked her one time, like, "Hey, how, you know, how was your week?" And she goes, "Oh, it's pretty good. You know, I, I bought a house yesterday." And I, I thought, well, "You know, you're 24. You know, <laughs> how is this possible?" And uh, turns out her family has like a long line of uh, real estate agents and real estate investors. And so uh, instead of investing in the 401k, her dad encouraged her to go buy a house. And I thought, wow, that's, you know, awesome. Like she's smart and pretty. And, and uh, so I did the next logical thing and I just called up her sister who was a real estate agent and said, uh, Hey, like, can you go find me a house in her neighborhood? (laughs) (laughs) And she's like, yeah, sure. And she kind of liked the idea of playing matchmaker. So sure enough, uh, I bought a house uh, in her neighborhood that was about seven blocks away and uh, did the exact same thing that she did, which was I house hacked it. So for those who aren't familiar, that's basically where you go buy a house. You live in it in one room as a primary residence and you rent out the other bedrooms uh, to help pay for your mortgage and your utilities. And now that was awesome for me because I was single. I didn't uh, I didn't have any baggage. I didn't have any belongings, really. I could fit everything in one bedroom, and it was perfect. So uh, sure enough, my roommates paid for uh, all of my mortgage and then all, almost all of my utilities. I, I think I paid about, I think it was $425 or somewhere close to that uh, a month just to live and pay for everything. So uh, it was a great way to save up money. And, and uh, what I did from there on is I just kind of took the equity out of each property and I bought another one and did a house hack and bought another one and did a house hack until I got married. And then that wasn't as feasible anymore. But, um, the story actually has a fantastic ending because, uh, that girl that I was trying to impress actually, uh, we started going out and then now we're married and we have a beautiful six year old daughter. So what? that's we awesome. Celebrated that's our 10 year anniversary. <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. A true real estate love story. Yeah. Um, the phrase is, uh, what is it? Diamonds are a girl's best friend, but real estate is a close second. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. <laughs> That's sweet, man. So so th- this was all in the D.C. area. Is that right? It was. Yeah, I grew up just outside of D.C. All my life, I actually grew up on a sheep farm. Mm-hmm. And so I have very weathered hands. I, I would feed the animals before I'd go to school. I know that sounds like I'm from the 20s, mm-hmm. but uh, but that was my life. And then uh, I went to college uh, near D.C. and then 
uh, just kind of stayed in the D.C. area. And so the, my first house was actually on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., which uh, is crazy expensive and crazy cool and just uh, one of my favorite places on the planet. Mm-hmm. Uh, just a really trendy area. That's kind of a... Uh... I mean, when I look at, at certain markets that are super expensive like that, it seems a little intimidating because, like, man, I, I don't know if I want to put so much money into something. What if it goes sideways? Yeah. I mean, were the properties still pretty easy to, you know, get positive cash flow from? I mean, have you ever run into issues with that? Or is it basically just bigger bigger versions of a smaller market, like bigger numbers? Yeah, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because it is, it is not the same as Cincinnati or um, – or anywhere really, any small town or mid-sized city in the Midwest. Um, it, it follows suit with a lot of coastal cities, though. Um, so D.C., New York, L.A., San Francisco, Portland, you know, um, even some bigger cities in Texas, where uh, where the housing prices are just so high that, that the 1% rule doesn't really make sense. So I know that there are a lot of real estate investors who just live and breathe by the 1% rule, which is, you know, where if you buy a house for hundred thousand dollars you have to be able to get one percent of that in rent so a thousand dollars a month mm-hmm. uh in order to make all the numbers work and don't get me wrong the one percent rule does work when you find it but in dc and in san francisco you're you know you're buying million dollar houses and you're not going to get one percent yeah so you know that's not going to stop people from investing in real estate but you just have to do it differently and so for me and i didn't hear about the one percent rule until my third house <laughs> yeah. you know and it was uh, it was just because the houses in D.C., for example, my first property was six hundred fifty thousand dollars and I was twenty five years old. Mm-hmm. And at the time, I didn't have even remotely close to like 20 or 30 percent down. And it was back in 2005 when they were just passing out, you know, 100 percent finance mortgages and oh. uh, it was easier to get. So uh, that's how I got my first one. And I was lucky enough to do that. And I, I bought. Uh, bought wisely. So what I did in order to make that make those numbers work was that uh, many of the houses in DC are large enough that you can have lots of roommates or or um, rooming houses. Even if you don't live there, you can rent out the room, or or at least you can rent out to a large group of people under one lease. Mm-hmm. And so uh, this was kind of before Airbnb, and you know now Airbnb is an option, and you can make a killing on that, but. Um, essentially what I do now with that same house, my very first property, which was a six bedroom on Capitol Hill for $650,000. I, I go and I find roommates, people who want to live together and they're typically, it just kind of typically attracts the people who are right out of college who are used to living in community and I'll get five or six friends who know each other and, uh, they'll all come to me at once through my ads and I'll say, listen, this is one single lease. You're all under joint and several liability. It's as if you were a family and uh, you're all on the lease and you're all responsible for rent. And when I do that, they're all willing to pay a whole lot more because really just to pay for their bedroom, it's like maybe 700 bucks. But if I were to try to rent that to a single family uh, who maybe has even two incomes, I, I wouldn't nearly be able to get as much. So a single family might only pay about three grand for that house. But a group of six roommates, each paying about seven or eight hundred or nine hundred bucks for a room, uh, together could could pay about fifty two hundred dollars. Yeah. And so that gets me a whole lot closer to that six per, or that one percent rule, um, and makes it obtainable. So I actually net about six hundred bucks a month on that property, mm-hmm. which wow. is great. That makes a lot of sense. Now I know in my town, I don't know if this exists in D.C. And if it does, I'd be curious to see, hear how you how you handle it, but. In Grand Rapids, there's this uh, rule where you can't have more than four unrelated people living under one roof. And mm-hmm. I think it's to basically <laughs> safeguard against brothels and stuff like that. Yep. Is that a thing in Washington, D.C.? <laughs> and if so, how do you do that? It is not a thing in in the city of Washington, D.C., but it is a thing in Arlington County and Alexandria County, which are just neighboring counties. Hmm. And what I've found, and I don't I don't know the rest of the country, but what I've found is that uh, I see that particular rule where it's no four unrelated, um, typically a little bit in the neighborhoods and the suburbs outside of the downtown metro areas, hmm. because they realize in downtown metro areas, you do have giant houses that have lots of bedrooms. Hmm. You know, you do have people looking to live in community a whole lot more than you do residences, like single family homes. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. so 
it's interesting that we're we're actually talking about this today because I'm faced with a, a similar market. I just moved to Chicago, right? So I'm I'm actually looking at house hacking and um and the different options that I have b- before me in my market. And I'm just curious, like if you were to do it again today, if you were dealing with a six hundred and fifty thousand dollar purchase price, how would you go about doing it? Because that's kind of what I'm facing, and I'm like, I don't have. I mean, I don't even know if I have three and a half percent down for an FHA loan on something like that. So right. what would you do uh, these days if you were to start over again? Yeah, I mean, if, it, if you're going to house hack it and it's going to be partly your primary residence, I I wouldn't raise the money from investors to get that deposit. Like, I, I feel like I would I wouldn't feel right going to someone and saying, hey, can you give me that three and a half percent down for an FHA mortgage so I can live in this property and be in an investor with it yeah. uh, simply because I wouldn't have any skin in the game, right? Uh, you could structure a deal potentially where uh, you act as the property manager or the onsite property manager, but then that changes tremendously. You know, the, the contract would be null if you ever moved out, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think that um, if it's ever going to be your primary, then I, I don't raise money for it. Um, if you can, if you can just save up for the three and a half percent, uh, and FHA is a great way to do it until you can get in and then and then get rid of that mortgage insurance or refinance out. So um, if you have any other properties or I know, Jaren, you you do land flips just like Seth, yep. you know, like you could you could easily raise that three and a half percent on a seven hundred thousand dollar property with like two deals. You know, I mean, that's. I yeah, would just come up with it. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of the the route that I was thinking. Have you touched into owner financing at all, or exploring like you know working with like a motivated seller or anything like that in a in a market like DC? Yeah, uh, I, I've never done it personally because it never made sense for the houses that I was buying, or the or the owners weren't willing. But um, but it's something that I've wanted to do and and could be a good option for you. I, I think if it's um, you can get in with no money uh, if you find the right one. But I think more importantly, it's better to find the right house than to find the right owner. Because if you find the right house and it's close to, you know, public transportation or or, or a subway or a metro or something like that, where there's just uh, a busyness that that younger tenants want to live at, then uh, then you'll make your money back in no time compared to a property that's in the wrong location with the right seller. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, Lucas, how many how many properties do you have right now? Five. Okay. We've got five properties in three states, uh, mostly single family homes, but I do have a vacation in Colorado, which is pretty cool because I get to use it part time when it's not used. So that's fun. Sure. Okay. And you, use, uh, you do Airbnb on that? I do. So that is the only property that I actually don't manage myself. So I actually have a full time property manager simply because it's listed on all the vacation rental sites and I need somebody to just be available 24 7, you know, for, for guests that come in. Most of the guests that attend that, uh, you know, reserve it on Airbnb or HomeAway or VRBO and then uh, check any time of day and then need help, you know, finding towels or getting toilet paper or whatever. So, uh, yeah, I need I had needed somebody on site um, and they do a great job. So I find that's an interesting one because I bought that. It, it's it's in the it's in Vail, Colorado. And I specifically bought in that that town because the numbers were amazing. So if I could because of the clientele and because of the rents that they were getting on a nightly basis, if I rented that, that apartment or that condo for a hundred nights out of a year, it would pay for itself. Wow. So the other 256 nights can be empty or I could go enjoy it or I could, you know, I could let guests stay there. I could do whatever. And it's at no cost to me. So the numbers were amazing. Um, and, and indeed we've had it for three years and it's, it's breaking even. So that's, just everything I hoped. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah it, it's funny. I was just reading an article that the about Airbnb and how the industry has somewhat changed. Like the, people are saying that it used to be very much like you're staying in someone's living room, but now it's really becoming somewhat industrialized, where you're you're kind of having like cheap hotel pillows and that kind of stuff and people are hiring property managers and I think it's interesting I'm, I'm curious to see where the future of Airbnb goes well I I don't know but I think that uh, I think for my place in particular I mean my property manager very much treats it like a hotel I mean you walk in you basically have little mints on your pillows like it's <laughs> it's incredible you have little little tiny hotel shampoos you know they're branded and uh, you got soap and I mean it's it's really an experience and I think that's where the more successful 
short-term rental managers are, are are going. That's what they're doing. And if they can compete with those hotels, then people won't stay in hotels. And that's what they're trying to do. Yeah. So how much how much do you pay your property management company? Is it just same like 10%? No, like, no. <laughs> so with vacation <laughs> rentals, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it can range anywhere from uh, from 22 percent up to 50, wow. and uh, we we pay ours 30 percent, and that includes all the management fees, all the supplies, and uh, all the credit card fees. So that's something you don't think about is when a guest books a short term rental on Airbnb. You know, you typically have you as the owner have to cover that credit card fee, hmm. uh, and if you're paying. You know, if the if they're paying two grand to stay a week and a half or two weeks or three weeks, you know that's a decent chunk of change. You know, so what what would make it cost fifty percent? That seems crazy. If if they can get away with it, they will. I think there's there's different levels of property managers, and so some are really high quality. Some are like built into the condo association that mm. if you have a giant building, you know, and they have a front desk and you know amenities that they're also handling too. Uh, that could be 50%. So okay. hmm. uh, some of the more luxury buildings in in Vail are certainly 50%. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went and hired an independent property manager, and yeah. that's how I got it to be 30. Do yeah. they do a pretty good job? I mean, is it like, I don't know, like when I look at my property manager for my rental properties, which is a totally different thing than what you're talking about, but I would not necessarily call it like world-class service. Like they do the basics to make sure all the bases are covered, but they're not going to go above and beyond to like make the property nice or make sure the tenant is like overjoyed every single day with their experience in the property with, with these higher end, you know, short term rental property management companies. Is it like, are they literally like serving people on hand and foot all the time? Like, uh, maybe it's a middle ground there. I mean, they're certainly not sitting there with a white, uh, white gloves and like, you know, <laughs> why not? <laughs> <laughs> like hand towels to wipe their hands off after the bathroom, right? But, uh, but uh, you know, my property manager, uh, one of the reasons we chose him is because he and his team go above and beyond. So they have they have their own cleaning staff that come in immediately after someone checks out, and they turn the place over in four hours so that the new guests can check in the same day. And they handle, you know, the annual cleanings, like the carpet cleanings, the annual deep cleanings. Um, and they even, you know, they think of little things like, for example – it's about the guest experience. And so if you, if a guest checks in late at night, let's say they drive from the airport, they finally get there, it's 11 o'clock night, all they want to do is kind of pull the stuff out of the car and go to bed. Well, the next thing they'd want to do in the morning is probably wake up and not have to worry about where am I going to find a cup of coffee, right? So, you know, he, he makes sure that there's, you know, disposable coffee, K-cups or grounds or whatever, they're on site ready to go every single time so that it'll get them through that first day. Right. And, and just that feeling of being taken care of goes a long way. And all it cost him was a cup of coffee. Yeah. So hmm. that's the kind of thing that you try to think of ahead of time and think about what are the guests actually going to feel and how can I solve their problems? With the properties that you do have, what would you say? I mean, this whole concept of trying to manage properties yourself on the other side of the country, like yeah. that doesn't even compute for, for most people. Like they wouldn't even think about that. How do you manage to do this? And what's the most challenging aspect of that? Wow. So I live in Colorado now mm-hmm. and all my properties except for one uh, are in D.C. So, yeah, 2000 miles away. And I've always managed my own properties, even when I was, you know, mainly when I was in D.C. It just felt felt wrong to me. Maybe I'm cheap or something, but it felt wrong for me to pay 10 percent for a property manager. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I could do a lot of the same stuff. But now it's a whole lot harder because I'm not there. And. Uh, I've been I've been remote uh, for about a year or a little over a year and and basically I've had to figure it out and so um, I invest in a lot of really great tools so uh, just like a mechanic you know if they have really great tools they can fix a car in no time at all and but if they don't have the right tools they just can't do it or they're gonna break something mm-hmm. and that's kind of the the way I've thought about it and so uh, as you said I do work for cozy and cozy makes that property management software so we we actually eat our own dog food and every landlord at at cozy uses cozy to manage their properties no matter where they are and (laughs) yeah so cozy i mean for those who don't know cozy is free it's uh it does everything so you can list your property you can find uh tenants you can have those tenants apply to your property through a website uh you can also screen those tenants with full background checks and full credit reports and then if you find the right tenant, then you can roll them right into online 
uh, rent collection. And that too is free. It's completely free to transfer the money back and forth. And so uh, we do, we are a for-profit company. We do make money on the credit reports and background checks. You know, if a tenant applies, they do have to pay for that, but you don't as a landlord. So it's truly no cost to the landlord. I've been using it for almost five years now and I've never paid anything for it, which is fantastic. And we're doing really well. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I do all that. So all of the major core things that happen, even maintenance requests you can do through Cozy, I do it through an online software. And my tenants absolutely love it. So I, I recently had a tenant move out. And I was talking to her a few days before she was leaving. And she's like, hey, um, you know, I, I, have a, I found a short-term rental that I'm going to stay at. Uh, but after that, I'd really love to stay in this neighborhood. And uh, do you know of any other landlords in this neighborhood to use Cozy? Because I don't really want to stop. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, that's... But that is truly a testimony, right? I mean, that's wow. like they're saying it's so great that as a tenant, I don't want to stop using it. I'd, I'd love to keep paying my rent online and have the full ledger and even have my online uh, online uh, rent payments get reported to the credit bureau so that I can start building and repairing my credit uh, through rent payments, which is something they get. So it's just a really great experience for on both sides, and it lets me do almost everything uh, remotely from 2000 miles away. I have a couple of questions on that. Sure. So to what degree can cozy serve other types of cash flow type real estate? So like take storage units, for example, or, you know, beyond just traditional, you know, single family houses, duplexes, multifamily, can it service something like a storage unit or how does that work? Can it, can it service like owner financing? Yes, yes. And yes. So Cozy is really just a framework. So, uh, you know, it's a tool, but, and it's designed for really independent landlords with less than 20 units. That's the, that's the target audience that we kind of designed it and made it look appealing for. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's really just a screening and, you know, rent collection and payment system, right? I mean, and you can do other things, but that's the core. And uh, we do have lots of landlords who have commercial storage units and boat slips and, co-working desk spaces. I mean, they're, they're using Cozy for like a 12 by 12 desk, right? Mm. And they're, they're renting out that desk to somebody on a daily basis. So we do have people doing that and, and using Cozy for that. But, but if you were to do that, and I know, Seth, you've used it for owner financing a bit, uh, and it works, but it will seem a little out of place simply because it says things like your landlord is asking you to pay rent or your, you know, your tenant is paying thousand dollars on the first mm-hmm. you know and, and in situations like a like a boat slip it's not really a landlord situation or a storage unit it's not really a landlord situation so the messaging is a little funny but uh, but it works it totally works mm-hmm. i'd be really curious to see what it would you know for people who sell land on on contract that yeah. might be a really cool alternative to what's out there because right now there's really not a uh, one size fits all solution for CRMs for for owner selling land on owner financing. So I'd be curious, Seth, have you messed around with Cozy in that regard? You know, I have not, but I have heard from a number of people who have. Uh, they basically use it to collect payments and put that kind of thing on autopilot. You know, I think it's uh, I think the value it has to bring to the table there is there are certainly like softwares out there like GeekPay or Actum or I'm not sorry, not Actum, uh, Zimple Money where they can certainly be used for that too. And they're actually designed for loans specifically. So it's nice in that regard, but you also have to maintain like a separate uh, Stripe account and an Actum account and all this, all this stuff. Well, so and it costs the, money too, whereas yeah, yeah, and the, whereas it's, it's added free. fees and it's just moving pieces and it's just, I don't know, it can be done. And if you're like on a huge scale, I think it's probably worth that. But with Cozy, it's, uh, it's, it's, is it basically just the credit card fee if somebody pays by a credit card? Right. Yeah. There's no extra accounts you need to set up with, with merchants or any, anything. It's just yeah. uh, you just pay with a credit card and the, the fee is 2.75% of whatever you're paying. And uh, the only option is for the tenant or the buying person, uh, you know, the, the person who's paying, making the payments is to pay that fee. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I know yeah, I haven't personally messed with uh, Cozy in the payment collection aspect of it, but I can say with uh, the credit reports and the background checks, like, you know, I used to work for uh, 10 years in the banking world. I've looked at tons of credit reports from lots of different credit reporting, reporting agencies in different formats. And, you know, a lot of credit reports, like in the banking industry, are just like wildly confusing. Like, <laughs> it's like you're trying to read some different language and there's very, very little explanation. 
So it's basically you need like a week's worth of training just to understand what you're looking at. And with the uh, the cozy credit reports, I've never seen anything so naturally intuitive and just I, I don't want to say it's going to make a hundred percent sense if uh, if you've never seen one before, but it's pretty close. I mean, it's not that hard to figure out what you're looking at, and also just the fact that like you're not paying for it, the applicant is huge, huge value adds. I I think uh, I'm definitely going to throw that around, man, because a lot of people ask me all the time for alternatives to uh, to CRMs for, for servicing loans as like a land flipper. So I'm going to start plugging cozy. I should get a right. t-shirt. Yeah. I know Seth has a t-shirt. You want yeah, one? That's right. I, yeah. well, I wear it well, yeah. all the time. Yeah, and also, if anybody's interested, um, I've got a couple videos out there that explain like how you can – pull credit reports and how to read them through Cozy specifically. So I'm going to link to those things in the show notes. And also, if you want to check out Cozy, we do have an affiliate link with them, retipster.com forward slash Cozy, C-O-Z-Y. So check that out too. So apart from like using Cozy to manage your properties, like what do you do when you need an on-site presence, like a set of eyes on a problem? Like do you have a a couple of realtor friends that you can hire or somebody else on site who can go visit it for you? I do. So yes, there are times where nothing will substitute having somebody on site. And how do you handle that? Right. I mean, from 2000 miles away, I can't go over there to check something out. Uh, and so there's a couple ways. And I think depending on the situation, it might call for one or the other, but uh, I always keep a lockbox on the property, usually somewhere kind of out of sight, and I don't give that combination to my tenants at all. Uh, and if I, if I have to, for some reason, I have it changed right away. So I, I know, and I've learned this from experience, um, while I do pick really great tenants and they are trustworthy people, uh, they will use that key for their friends or their mom who can't get in and don't have a key and they just forgot, right? It's, it's not malicious. They just forgot. And then that key will not go back. So, um, so I only give it out to my contractors and I do have a small little black book of contractors that I trust. And that is the key. So you want to have people in the town uh, who are, you know, skilled and capable workers who do uh, do uh, treat your tenants with respect. You know, so they'll go over. They won't uh, they won't invade their bedrooms. They won't make, uh, you know, crazy noises outside at 730 in the morning. Like they'll be respectful. And then uh, what those people do, those, those workers not only uh, have your, your back when repairs need to happen, is that they also kind of keep an eye on the property. So they, they kind of look um, for other things that might need to be fixed, even if it's not ready or really broken. I actually tell my contractor, I was like, hey, listen, if you go over there, just please like look around. And if you see something that you want to fix, like just send me a text with a picture of it and how much you want to charge and do it. Like just do it because... Um, that will save me so much time in the long run and hassle trying to deal with my tenants when they report it and how to handle it. So that's how I, I kind of keep uh, the maintenance working. And so Cozy actually has a maintenance uh, tracking system. So when a tenant does report something, it's super easy. They just, let's say the, the sink is leaking, they'll just snap a picture of it with their phone, fill out a little tiny form on inside Cozy and uh, and attach the picture and boom, like I've got everything there and I can I can have a discussion with them inside Cozy in a threaded forum where uh, all the conversation is documented. All of the roommates can see that information, too. So I say, you know, like, hey, the contract is coming over on Tuesday at four. Like they all see that and they all get notified about that. So it's not like I have to actually send another form of notice. So th that's really, really uh, the best way that I've learned how to handle maintenance. And I, I choose contractors that I trust. That's really the key. Mm -hmm. Now, when there's other things like showings, you know, when maybe it's between tenants or when a tenant is on the way out or you don't have a good relationship with them, you know, you do need somebody to do showings. And so uh, I do it two ways. One is uh, I, I work really hard throughout the year to make sure I do have a great relationship with that tenant. And uh, if I do, then I will say, hey, listen, if I set up some showings and if I like find really good pre-qualified tenants, can I pay you to show the property? Mm. And now they're just living there. They're just that their home. So that's okay. They're not breaking any rules um, or, you know, run real estate licenses or anything. It's their home. And uh, what I do is I say, Hey, listen, I'll give you 50 bucks. You know, if I'm desperate, sometimes it's 25, but I'll give you 50 bucks for each showing and I'll line them up. I'll make sure they're pre-qualified. You know, I'm not going to waste your time. 
And if I end up signing a lease with one of those groups or those tenants, then I'll give you another hundred dollars. So what that does is it tells the tenant, okay, well, one, I want to be prompt and cordial and nice and respectful. And I also want to make sure the place is clean because it shows well, because I might get another hundred dollars out of it. Mm-hmm. So they do care. It, it makes them invested. And at the end of the day, you know, if I pick really good pre-qualified tenants and then, and then they show it and they they do a good job, usually I can get away with only showing the property maybe two or three times. Yeah. And so I come away with 200 bucks out of my pocket and a brand new tenant. Yeah. Now, when you talk there about picking really good pre pre qualified tenants, just about to ask that. <laughs> yeah, like like, is there some red flag you're looking for, like just in a credit report or a background check that's like, absolutely not because of this, or yeah. is there is there something beyond just the reports where you're like trying to have an interview to you know understand their character as a person, like like what are the what are the pros and cons you're looking for in a good pre qualified tenant? Yeah, you know. Um, so just like in the mortgage industry, when um, there's like pre-qualified and pre-approval, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, pre-qualified isn't as great, right? It just means like you have the ability to qualify um, and that we've kind of scoped you out, but it doesn't mean you're approved yet. And uh, in the same way for tenants, I don't, well, I should say this. It's very difficult to convince somebody to pay an application fee or a screening fee when they haven't seen the property yet. I mean, mm-hmm. some People will do that, but far and you know, by far, most of them won't. And it's just because they, they're not sure. They don't want to spend the forty bucks on it. And uh, so what I do is I basically, you know, if they're interested, I'll say, hey, listen, can I can I just call you and we'll talk for five minutes? It'll literally be really quick. Uh, I figured it'd be a great opportunity for us to figure out a time to to show the place to you. But also, I'd love to ask you some questions. And they're always really receptive to that if they're if they're interested in the place. And uh, what that means is I'll just literally take five minutes to. You know, I'm looking for a, a potential start date of June 1st. You know, does that match up with what you're thinking? Or uh, this is a non-smoking, non-pet house. Or, you know, I, I look in at your credit report and background check and I don't accept any evictions. You know, those kinds of things that are deal breakers for me, for me or the house. And uh, that will uh, kind of weed out either the tire kickers or the people that just have issues like they want to move in two months later. Um, and I'm not willing to accept that. So when I say pre-qualified, it's really at a high level. And then I know I kind of tell them like I'm looking for, you know, somebody with very little credit card debt, you know, doesn't have, um, you know, doesn't have a 500 credit card sc- or credit score, like basic things. And uh, they will self eliminate. They, they really will. They won't show up at the showing or they won't uh, they won't proceed. So uh, I, I pick those types of people mm-hmm. and then uh, they'll go see the place. And if they like it. Then they'll fill out the form for the app or for the application and the screen report, and it all get all the real information. Um, but you know that doesn't take much time. That's only five minutes, and I know there's a pretty good chance that if they pass that conversation, they're probably going to pass the screening report too. So that's what I mean by pre-qualified. So it sounds like some obvious deal breakers would be if they've had evictions. Is it like ever or just recently? Yeah, so I think uh, in many states, everyone, you know, landlords are required to come up with an actual list of criteria that you judge all tenants by. And I think that's wise. I mean, in some states, they don't require you to actually write it down, but it is wise to come up with that list. And so uh, there's no standardized state law list. You kind of have to make it up for yourself, but you do have to judge everybody the same. So for me. So you could say, uh, like, for example, I don't like your age, I don't like your religion. Um, things like that. Who knows? That's okay. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. Sure. <laughs> if you want to go to jail. Uh, <laughs> uh, but for me, I, the standard criteria, and I, I'm happy to tell this to them, and I, I try to tell this to them in that five minute conversation. It's just, um, I look at your credit score. I typically don't accept anybody under uh, with a 650 or less credit score. Mm-hmm. Uh, but more importantly, I'm looking for the type of debt. You know, if you have. $300,000 on a credit card. I don't want to accept you. I'm not going to accept you, but you know, but I don't really care about medical debt or student loan debt. Like those are different types of debts that are okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and I tell them if you've ever had an eviction ever. And, and when I say that, I, I don't mean your landlord kicked you out. I mean, you actually fought them in court and the judge ruled against the tenant and said, mm-hmm. you had no right to stay there. You should have paid rent. And now you have to leave. You know, that's a judgment. That's a real eviction. And uh, if they have that, then they are not staying in my place because that means they felt like they were owed 
free rent or they were incorrectly judged the situation. I don't want to deal with them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those types of things, um, usually not non-smoking, usually no pets and that, that kind of stuff too. Mm -hmm. What I hope people are seeing through what you're saying about like, like looking at the credit report and credit mm -hmm. history is this is something I actually sort of struggle with because I always want to see like, you know, check this box and everything is okay. Or, yeah. you know, just very simple equations. But a lot of times, like, there's real critical thinking involved. Like, you can't just look at the number of their credit score and make a definitive, wise decision based on that. You have to understand, like, what's going on behind that. And, like, you know, for example, if they missed payments on a certain debt or something, like, what kind of debt was it? And why did they miss it? What were the circumstances behind that? Um, it's like usually to really understand what's going on, it involves some complexity and understanding of the situation. So. Yeah, for sure. You know, uh, I didn't mention income because I, I do have a rule, but it's not hard and fast. And I, it drives me nuts when people stick to like a hard and fast income rule. So, for example, the common scenario is that you have to make two to three times the monthly rent in your total household income. Right. So if you make uh, if the rent's a thousand bucks, you have to bring home or you have to make before taxes two thousand to three thousand dollars a month, uh, and that's I think that's really smart. But what happens if they don't have a job at the point, right? I mean, that doesn't necessarily rule them out. Uh, you know, I, I what if they they had two million dollars in the bank or they're they're a trust fund baby and they're getting the salary but they don't have a job, mm -hmm. uh, and so you you do have to critically think about that. You do have to kind of look at the big picture. Um, I've had people who, you know, make $10,000 a month, but half of that's going to child support, mm -hmm. you know, and so you, you do have to rule that out. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of like what uh, Dave Ramsey used to say uh, years ago. He tried to rent an apartment, but uh, he got declined because he doesn't have a good credit score. I mean, Dave Ramsey has not used a credit card in <laughs> in two decades, right? Mm -hmm. So his credit score is probably in the 400s, I, I guess. Uh, and he jokes about it because he got denied, but he could turn around and write a check for the whole building, mm -hmm. the whole apartment complex. He could buy it in a heartbeat, but he can't rent a place there mm -hmm. because they wouldn't accept him because all they did was look at the credit score. You know? So you got to critically think about it. Yeah, it kind of tells me the flawed thinking behind a lot of banks and lenders. Um, I think when you get like to really high level, like huge million dollar commercial loans they they just buy by the nature of that dig a lot deeper and understand what's going on but a lot of like mortgage lenders they do have those hard and fast rules where it's just like you got to fit this cookie cutter shape or it's not going to work and they can't think outside of that it's kind of frustrating sometimes yeah i mean especially being like 1099 or being you know self-employed it's it's a, a real hassle you know, because mm -hmm. they don't even look at you for two years, like just as a default, no matter what, like no matter how, what kind of money you're making. So it's yeah. frustrating. Uh, Lucas, what exactly are you doing for Cozy right now? Like what is your position and what does that involve on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis? Great question. So I actually uh, am changing my role a little bit and it's, it's really exciting. So for the last year and a half, I've been a, a product manager there. Mm -hmm. I also help lead up landlordology.com still. So I, I, I'm in charge of that. But um, but the uh, product manager aspect that I was doing for a year and a half, I, I would help build new features like uh, maintenance tracking or expense tracking uh, or automatic leap fees inside Cozy, uh, which was super great because I use it myself. I, I got to build the things that I was going to use, mm -hmm. which was exciting. Um, but I also I, I have uh, I have skills in uh, growth and networking and public speaking and, and just getting the name of Cozy out there. So uh, so that's where I'm focusing. Uh, we are seeing. Um, we are seeing over 10,000 people, 10,000 landlords sign up for Cozy a month uh, just to use it, which is incredible. But I, I'd really love to see that at like 50,000 a month. So, That's insane. That's <laughs> a lot of, holy cow, man. That's huge. Yeah, it is. It's catching on. I mean, it's free and it works well, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's yeah. like you can't, you can't build a better uh, scenario. So, yeah. So, I mean, my, my job now is really just to go spread the, the name of Cozy out there and make sure people know about it because... Uh, once they understand what it's offering, it's a it's a, um, a no brainer. Like they they just are like on board, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they would love to get rid of their checkbook, or they would love to not have to deal with mail uh, and collecting rent checks or screening tenants, or even having to pay for something uh, like some of the more expensive software. So mm -hmm. uh, it's not it's not hard to convince somebody to use Cozy, mm -hmm. and uh, and our attrition rate is incredibly small. We don't we don't see people leave once they start using it. So yeah. my job is just to spread the 
the name of Cozy out there mm-hmm. and whatever means necessary. <laughs> we didn't really dive into what landlordology is. So what's the like two second synopsis of of what landlordology is and what it what it can do for our audience if they're curious. So back when I was trying to impress that girl, you know, <laughs> bought my first rental property, I, I had uh, I had had some success with uh, with my first rental property, and I, and I started seeing that that uh, my my friends and my neighbors kind of wanted to get into real estate, and so they were coming to me asking questions, and I thought, well, there's something here, right? Like I, I'm I've learned enough, I've read enough books about it, I feel like I'm pretty savvy, so let's just start blogging, right? And so I just started writing my heart out and I, I would spend most of the night or most of the evenings just blogging. Right. And, uh, what it turned into was an incredibly useful resource and it started getting a ton of traffic from Google. It was growing uh, 400% year, you know, year over year at first. And it was just really, really doing well. And it got the attention of a lot of companies. So, uh, what landlordology still is, is a free educational website for landlords. So we will teach you how to be a landlord. And then with Cozy, we will also give you the tools to do it for free. So it's kind of like if you don't know how to fish and you want to learn how to fish, you know, we'll give you the education. We'll teach you about the best practices, how to do it, how to throw that rod out there, you know. And then we'll also give you the boat, the tackle, the rod, the line, and then all the friends that go with you to help you do it. Mm -hmm. So that's what Cozy and Landlordology are together. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, like, it's free. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a it's an amazing resource. I remember years ago when I first started blogging, I mean, it was really one of the websites I looked up to just in terms of how it was laid out, just the quality information. And, you know, I think at the time, I forget what year it was, 2013 or something, the first time we ever talked to Lucas. And, and uh, I think you guys were getting like over 30,000 a month in visitors or something like that. And that was like mind boggling to me. I could not believe how huge that was. I'm like, oh my word, what is this guy doing? <laughs> so yeah, he's done a really good job of it and uh, Cozy continues to do a really good job since they've kind of taken it over. So, Thanks. Yeah. yeah, man. What are you thinking the future is gonna look like for you, Lucas? What, do you have any immediate plans for the next 12 months on where you want your real estate business to go or anything like that? Yeah. So. Uh, maybe I'll answer that in two parts. So professionally, I, I'm super excited to see what happens with Cozy. So we are um, we are an angel backed company. So we have some of the best investors on the planet, um, like Tim Ferriss and Gary Vaynerchuk and Google, and they uh, gave us the money that we needed to get started. But now we're actually making money, and so it's kind of like we can make our own destiny, right? And so mm-hmm. we are a profitable startup, which is you know very rare, yeah. and uh, and we're growing incredibly. So. Professionally, I, I think Cozy is just going to continue to take off, and that 10,000 new landlords a month is going to turn into 50 eventually. And um, and we do process currently we process uh, one and a half billion dollars in rent every year, and I, I would love to see that get to like 10 billion, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that's totally obtainable, and there's not much to stop us right now. But uh, but personally. While as much as I love Cozy, I also love investing in real estate. And I have just moved to Colorado. I'm super excited about the new environment. And um, I've kind of got this like itch to buy a big apartment building or a big apartment complex. And I haven't been able to really shake that itch. So I'm learning about apartment syndication. Um, I'm probably going to pick up a few single family homes here too. But uh, but I'd really love to buy like a 60, 80, or 100 unit complex and uh, and start to really explore that. So mm-hmm. I, I don't know how I'm going to raise that much money, but I'll figure it out. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's awesome, cool, man. Sweet. Um, so Jaren and I, this is something we've never done this before until you now, Lucas. But we've come up with <laughs> five rapid fire questions that we're going to be asking uh, everybody who comes on this show. So we're going to start hitting those right now. So question number one, what is the single most impactful principle you've used in your life or business? Help people. So I love teaching. I I feel like I have the heart of a teacher and that's why I started Landlordology and the amount of the number of relationships, including both of you, right? I mean, the quality of relationships that have come back to me just by trying to help somebody else succeed it is the best thing I've ever learned. I, I really do think that if you go out and you try to help other people achieve their goals, they're 
they're just going to love you for the rest of their life and they, they will constantly try to help you. And, and eventually it comes back to you, you know, tenfold. So th- it took me a long time to learn that. But once I did, it's so rewarding uh, emotionally, but it also is, um, it helps you be successful and profitable and, and just helps you feel good. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of those things that kind of goes against yep. human nature for a lot of people. It's just like, you know, why am I going to just give all of my resources for nothing? You know, totally unprovoked, but I, I agree. And I've found the same kind of thing. It's pretty amazing what happens when you're willing to do that. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. So what is the biggest life lesson you've learned from a mistake or failure? <laughs> oh. To not get rapid fire questions like this. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, gosh, failure. I, you know, when I would pursue my selfish ambitions, when it was just about me, uh, I usually would end up empty handed, you know, but it, to go to tie in the last one, when I would try to help people, for example, um, I got my first job when I went to like a, a, a social environment and, or, you know, it's like a social networking for the company. They would sponsor it and then bring in all these potential candidates or people who are interested. And I just, uh, I had heard somebody on a podcast the week before, and they said, when you go to these job meetings, don't actually try to get the job. Just try to help somebody else get the job. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you know, but all I did was I, I listened and I talked to other candidates and talked to other people. And what that did, well, like, and I didn't talk about myself hardly at all. What that did, it was a told the, the employers that this is somebody that I might want to work with. Like, mm-hmm. this is a real person. Yeah. This is somebody who cares about other people. And that's the type of person we want to work for us. And I got the job. I did. They offered it to me, even though the, all the other people were seem more qualified and were more outgoing. That's interesting. Super oh. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it totally was backwards. So anyway, um, but I had a lot of other job interviews before that that didn't go so well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that, uh, biggest failure, geez, You know, uh, on a personal level, just get real deep. I've had a career for about 15 years now, some some real estate, some in IT consulting, and I am very driven. And I've I've seen the damage that is done to my wife and my family and just not separating work and home. So uh, in the last couple of years, I've really tried to like totally cut work off at a certain time and just say, this is not my life like it's work is not my life and it shouldn't be and it's helped it really has helped so mm-hmm. that's, that's something i've learned from a failure yeah. took me 10 years to figure it out but <laughs> it's hard every day it's hard because yeah. i always think i can do more yeah absolutely man thanks for sharing that what is your biggest pain point in business right now and what do you think is the most viable solution for dealing with that um with well i'll answer it two parts so in business and, and with cozy it's uh, it's just getting it out there. So, like I said before, spread. Like once I tell somebody about Cozy, that's the you know, it's easy from that point on. They're like they see the value, they sign up, and they they switch. But uh, getting out there is difficult because uh, I'm only one person, and you know we don't want to spend billions of dollars on advertising. That's silly. But, uh, but yeah, just getting it out there. And so I'm trying my hardest to try to do maximum outreach. So for example, Seth, you introduced me to direct mail and gave me some really good ideas there. So, you know, we're going to try that and we're just going to get that out there. Um, more personal level though, biggest challenges is, uh, uh, trying to set up a new real estate business in a, in a new, uh, city, something that I'm not familiar with. So for DC, I had my whole life to learn the area and learn the neighborhoods and learn, where the the best houses were and i don't know denver very well <laughs> don't know it very well at all and uh and i'm gonna try to buy something i've never bought before like a 100 unit complex and so i all of that's unknown and i've got to learn it as i go and i've got to learn it in my spare time mm-hmm. so uh, i'm not scared i'm just kind of excited but also like a nervous excitement so mm. yeah. that's my big challenge so far yeah, man, it's tough going into a new market, learning those things. It's like, I mean, I'm I'm in a very similar boat, just moving from Indiana to Chicago. It, like, the culture is very, very different. The laws are very different. So, if there's any way I can, you know, swap re- mm-hmm. resources with you or whatever, just let me know, man. Yeah, we should call each other and just console each other. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, 
If you could know the absolute and total truth to one question, what question would you ask? <laughs> These are super easy questions, by the way. I don't know. Yeah, it's all... ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I am a Christian, and I I love the Lord, and I think that I would love to know why there aren't. <laughs> this is so. I'm getting spiritual here. Um, it's hard to see miracles in the way that they used to. 2000 years ago, or at least what the Bible says happened. Mm -hmm. Those things don't happen as much, uh, you know, at least in America, I don't see them a lot. I I hear stories about other third world countries getting really crazy, but uh, crazy miracles, but uh, you don't see them a lot. And I would love to see them more. And I I would, if I could get one answer, I would, I would ask why that isn't the case. You know, why I'm seeing them. Sometimes I hear people argue about whether or not they can prove something. But another question to ask is like, well, how do you define proof? Like, at what point are you convinced that something is true or not? Um, You know, people trying to prove things that happened 2,000 or billions of years ago or whatnot. It's like, nobody was there. There's really, you know, there's all kinds of different ways you can look at something. How do you really know what proof is? And maybe it's the same kind of thing with miracles. Like, what is a miracle? Like, the fact that my heart is beating right now and I'm still breathing. Like, how does that work? Is that a miracle? (laughs) But I do understand what you mean. Like miracles in the sense of like crazy things happening that you don't see every day. It would be interesting to know the answer to that. Okay. So what is the most interesting thing you've read or seen in the past month? Oh gosh. Uh, you know, interesting thing. I might, (laughs) this is going to be totally nerdy, but, uh, I'm reading two books. Uh, one is called, how to lie with statistics. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the other one is uh, measure what matters. Mm-hmm. And they are some of the most fascinating books I've ever read. And so my wife calls me boring because she, she reads young adult fiction. She actually is <laughs> a, a, an award-winning young adult novelist. And I'm like reading books on mutual funds. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but these two books are incredible. So if you like statistics or data at all, um, go check check those out, how to lie with statistics and how to, or, and measure what matters. And how to lie with statistics is, is fascinating because it goes into the, the sounds th- very useful by the way. I'd love to know how to yeah. do it. <laughs> so it, it's not encouraging you to lie. What is actually <laughs> doing? Oh, shoot. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Never mind. I don't care. <laughs> It, it like reveals the cur- like it takes back the curtain on how media and industry actually lies with statistics. And so, mm-hmm. you know, how you, uh, you know, use charts and data to sh- reveal a story that isn't actually there and to show a beautiful chart or an image or a pictograph that that uh, while it isn't actually saying something, it is, you know, under the under the surface, revealing a whole different message. And and they're doing that on purpose. Like, don't be fooled. That is certainly uh, what their intent is. But they're not lying. So, uh, you know, it's it's just very revealing. The other book is Measure What Matters. And that is the story of Andy Grove uh, over at Intel and how he – uh, uh, implemented something called OKRs and there it's uh, objectives and key results. And uh, I've heard of that, but it, it is a revolutionary uh, method to, to getting stuff done. And it's fantastic if you have to work in teams or companies and if you can adopt the methodology of OKRs, it, I think it will work better than any other methodology I've ever seen. So I, uh, I'm just super impressed with what they did over at Intel and, it's not, I shouldn't say it's new, it's back from the 70s and 80s, but um, but is amazing. So it's worth checking out and hearing the stories that have come out of it and how the most successful companies have adopted these and then you see the results. Wow. So worth checking out. Yeah, mm-hmm. I just got back from the Leadership Summit at Willow Creek and one of the talks was the most fascinating talk I've ever heard. It was about um, essentially how data-driven analysis is really the key to true success. And he actually, this guy who is speaking, traveled the world and like went to all these places where the top athletes came from. Like these, like what he went to the training center in Kingstown, Jamaica, where Hussein, Usain Bolt like trains. And what was crazy is that the guy that trained him is this super fat, like he has actually like video footage of this guy. He's super fat, never ran a day in his life, but he was a statistics major at the university. And his entire approach to training is all based on numbers. 
Mm. It is fascinating. So, mm. so I actually have a shot at being a track coach then. Is that yeah. <laughs> I just got to learn the the statistics numbers part. Cool, Lucas. Well, as we wrap this up, first of all, thank you very much for giving your time and talking with us and sharing your ideas and experience. Uh, if people want to find you or connect with you, where do they go? How do they do that? Sure. Yeah, you can find me uh, on landlordology.com or cozy.co. That's C-O-Z-Y dot C-O. Mm -hmm. uh, and my email address is lucas at landlordology.com is where, where I handle questions and answers and uh, things about landlording. So feel free to check me out there. Cool. Yeah, and we'll include links to all that stuff, including those two books he was just talking about in the in the show notes for, for this episode. Now, thank you for what you're doing. I think just sharing people's stories is exactly what this world needs. So thank you for yeah. this podcast. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for what you're doing for the world, for real estate investors. I know it's been really helpful to a lot of people. Um, thanks again, Lucas. We will talk to you later, man. Bye, guys. Thanks.